Green Hornet is at number 10. Which I didn't like at all, and it looked to me like it absolutely wasn't a Michel Gondry film. It wasn't the sort of film that he would uh, you know, want to make had he had full artistic control. The 3D is all over the place. It's baggy and pointless. Brighton Rock is at number 9. Which I like more than some people because I'm quite interested by the idea of putting together Brighton Rock and Quadrophenia. Although, funnily enough, somebody uh, sent me a tweet which said, actually, if you think about it, Quadrophenia in the first place could legitimately be argued as being an un- uncredited remake of Brighton Rock, so the whole thing comes full circle. I mean, it is flawed, and there are moments when the things work and moments when it, does, when it doesn't, but I do think Sam Riley's good in it. Mark Stewart in Barry St Edmund says, uh, when watching Brighton Rock at the excellent, recently refurbished Abbeygate Picture House, red wine and reclining seats, I realised that the Mods and Rockers battle was not the only musical turmoil taking place on the beach. Right. Ian Curtis and Ian Curtis were going at it hammer and tongs beneath the pier. Yes, that's right. That's the absolutely form. right. Sam Riley yeah. control, Sean Harris, 24-hour party people. Con- is, they have a fight, the, yeah. Is this the only case of two characters from different screen interpretations of the same character duking it out on neutral territory in a different film. It's very good. The, the, the fight happens very, very early on. It is two people who've both played Ian Curtis knocking seven bells out of each other on the sea. And control wins. Control wins, yes. But of course it's Eastbourne, isn't it? But rather than Brighton, because Eastbourne looks like Brighton used to. Yeah, I, I can't think of another case, but there must be some. Tweet us and let us know. Uh, yes, or you can email mail at bbc.co.uk. You can text 85058. A very long email from Ian. Uh, That's the short version. The short version is this. My companion and I thought it was one of the worst films I've seen in recent years. Had Pete Postlethwaite been playing the John Hurt part, as was intended, it wouldn't have been any better. It made us think just how assured and enjoyable Morning Glory was. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it is... I mean, I know some people have really taken against it and Desecration of a Classic, you know, what have you done to Graham Greene, what have you done to Richard Attenborough... Uh, I think it, as I said before, I think it's an interesting idea as somebody who's interested in the Stanley Cohen folk devils and moral panics thing. It doesn't work uh, for some of it, but for some of it, it works quite well. Andre Riseborough is, is it Risborough or Riseborough? I think it's Risborough. Risborough, but, but you're asking me who spelt Cohen. Cohen, so. yes, exactly. Uh, Gulliver's great. Travels uh, with two L's at number eight. Well, it's finally going out, isn't it? Well, um, it's still at number eight. It's stationary at number eight. No it's move. It's not moved from six. I mean. I mean, okay, it, I, that's fine. That's yeah. enough. New entry at seven, a little bit of heaven. Awful. Just awful. Uh, six is The Mechanic. Which arguably is better than the original. Um, I like Jason Statham a lot. Uh, there is a. It is worth saying there is a bizarre uh, sexuality about the the screenplay that you c- c- couldn't quite get my hand my, my, get my, my hat on about whether or not it was, you know, did it think it was being sardonic or ironic or was it actually a little bit homophobic? I couldn't quite tell, but then it was just in the end people running around beating each other up, so I kind of got over it. New entry at number five: James Cameron presents Sanctum. I do think if people go and sit, they might expect James Cameron at to, least to appear and say, "Ladies and gentlemen, Sanctum." At least. At least. The very least you can do if you present it. Yeah. In the end, if you want a movie about people getting trapped down scary caves, The Descent was made for £1 million or something like that. It's better. It's got better characters. It's scarier. If you want 3D caving movie, Werner Herzog's Cave of Forgotten Dreams is coming. Oh, can I just say, because people keep uh, sending me messages about this, I said that if David Lynch makes a 3D movie... I will go to the Bristol watershed and eat my shoe. I've known for a while that the Werner Herzog caving movie. In fact, I've seen the Werner Herzog caving movie now. That's fine. But it's David Lynch making a 3D movie. But I promise I will do this if David Lynch makes a 3D movie. And I think it's, getting, it's becoming an inevitability because Herzog and Lynch are obviously very close. I will go to the Bristol watershed and eat my shoe. I mean, that's just very unhealthy. I mean, you can't really, shouldn't really eat a shoe, should you? Because it's got nails in and... Well, it's... No, it's le- I mean, no, you, I don't think you're going to eat the whole shoe. Well, you said you're going to eat a shoe. You're well, eat a shoe, you don't eat a shoe. Have you seen Werner Herzog eats his shoe? No. Right, well, he doesn't eat... The, I mean, he has a good go at eating the shoe. But, I mean, obviously, to digest the whole... I mean, the rubber... I mean, look, that, that's, a, that's a size 14 Dr. Martin where air you walk. Well, you brought it up, so I just... I All right, well, I tell you, well, fine, thank you. Since it's a big thing for you, I will try and eat the whole thing. I don't want you to eat any of it. Well, then don't pick me up. And I I'm, I will, I'm said I'm going to go to Bristol and eat my shoe if he makes a film, which he hasn't done yet. Anyway, number four is Black Swan. Still, uh, of all the films, this is the one that gets the most uh, correspondence still. For example... Michael Crowder says, I finally saw Black Swan yesterday, totally blown away. While I've heard many describe it as the wrestler in a frock, I thought the fusion (laughs) of obsession with delirium was closer in tone to Aronofsky's second film, Requiem for a Tutu. Anyone? A great film, well worth the Oscar nods. Actually, it's closer to everything that Dario Argento did in the 70s and 80s. This from Kate Middleton, brackets, no, not that one. This is the one who's the director of Care at Hitchin Christian Centre. Says, just back from seeing Black Swan. 
think I might cancel my five-and-a-half-year-old daughter's ballet lessons. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting one, which I include because it's from a ballet dancer, Emma Lister, uh, who says, so this is my view, as a professional ballet dancer of over a decade. Um, now that I've seen the film, it seems my professional duty to have an opinion on the film, as everyone is asking me about it. I tell my friends I would highly recommend the film as a fan of the horror genre, not as a dancer yeah, exactly. or a dance fan. It is a film about a character's pursuit of a singular goal or obsession that will ultimately overwhelm them. A film about a woman's descent into madness, not about mounting a production of Swan Lake. Though I did, uh, I did not see myself or my peers in some of the more dramatic, violent flourishes of the film, I have experienced, as have all dancers, the same concern consuming power that the profession has. I too have rung my mum from a loo stall when I've had good news from an audition, though I hasten to add my mother is not of the mummy dearest sort, so could not help but be moved by the film and Portman's performance in it. Any inaccuracies in the running of the ballet company, and there are some, I think can be disregarded, as it's a film where the line between what is real and what is imagined is tenuous at best, a line exactly. which the director very much asks us to question. Well, I mean, I agree. The fact that, that anyone can still think that it is a ballet film and then go along and be shocked is quite surprising. It is a giallo uh, a tribute. It's a film that's clearly inspired by Argento and then therefore before him by Mario Bava. And I was with Argento earlier on this week and I was saying, you know, how do you feel about the fact that this huge big Oscar contender, which is so clearly inspired by your work is out there and I think his feeling about it was well yeah fine but you know I'd rather keep my ideas to myself uh, so that's at number four The Fighters at Three new entry which I, which I think is fine I like Christian Bale uh, very much but I think Christian Bale was right when he got the Golden Globe for saying that you can only do a performance that big if you're doing it against somebody doing a performance as small and contained as the one that Mark Wahlberg is doing I do think Wahlberg in the end is the true hero of, of that film there is a sense that the fighter is the wrestler light I mean obviously Aronofsky is involved in it and was initially initially on board to, to direct but I think it's good I don't think it's a masterpiece but I think it's good uh, and we have this from Jack Blackburn, who says, I went to see The Fighter this week, interested in a movie described on the poster as the best boxing film since, since Rocky. Rocky from Esquire magazine, who apparently missed Raging Bull altogether. It's a shame, therefore, that the actual film should be so thoroughly ordinary. It's not a bad film. Mm -hmm. Solid, pretty watchable, pretty interesting fare, but this is pure Hollywood, clichéd and predictable. It says very little, jogs along, following the expected path, safe, occasionally funny and unremarkable. The victories do not seem to matter as much as they should. The trials and lows of the film are not very affecting nothing stands well, out. I mean, in their defence, I mean, it is a true story. Um, so the thing about it following the expected... Well, you, the, the, it did happen, I mean, at least within the bounds of anything being a true story. But I agree, it's, I think it, it is ordinary. I think the idea that David O. Russell is nominated and Chris Nolan isn't for Best Director is absurd. Uh, King's speech at number two, pretty much everything has been said, but this email from a still happily married Zach Jacobson. Uh, this is our New Zealand friend and the best man speech. Remember, said hello to Jason. That's Isaac right, yes. And all that. Recently saw King's speech in a packed theatre uh, in Matakana in New Zealand. As I settled into my seat, I noticed the girl a few seats down from me reading her iPad. A sense of great dread fell on me. Then a woman came in and took the seat next to me, pulled out a bag of M&Ms that was left unopened. Another scare as I realised that at some point during the film this bag would be opened, opened and its contents crunched. Not a moment later, a girl walks in with her boyfriend and proceeds to take her shoes off and place them on the seat in front of her. So here we are, perfectly poised for a multi-breakage of the rules. Yes. At this point, says Zach, I was close to tears at the cinema sacrilege. However, as soon as the film started, the iPad went off, the M&Ms were put away, and the feet were placed back on the floor in some shoes. Then I sat through the quietest movie screening that I had ever been in. The film was brilliant, and I was overcome by a great desire to applaud at the end, but for some reason I didn't. I just didn't want to be the one that started it. So, Very good. There, go. there was a documentary on television last night about you know the true King speech story, which I found myself dipping in and out of and thinking, oh, he wasn't half as good-looking as Colin Firth, was he? And this... Uh, Yes, Tangled is at number one. I've got an email about it, but Tangled, you go first. Well, I, you know, I think Tangled is fine. I enjoyed it. I thought the 3D was pointless other than the bit at the end with the lanterns. I didn't think it was classic uh, you know, uh, Disney by any means. I do think it would appeal to girls and boys, and it's perfectly good fun. It, you know, actually, of the stuff that's available for them this uh, half term, it is the standout offering. I just don't think it's timeless. I don't think it's up there with uh, Frog and the Princess, for example, certainly not with uh, Beauty and the Beast, or nor indeed Hunchback of Notre Dame, which I still hold is the great overlooked uh, title.